the, the reason why he didn't get invited, for example, to the Grand Chess Tour, which is what people are mostly talking about on Norway Chess, is because his rating at the start of the year, when, or yeah, at the start of the year when the invitations were being handed out, was lower than Pragnanta, was lower than Noterbeck, Abdusatara, uh, and was lower than Gukesh. But this also does encourage maybe some countries to invest more heavily in chess, like, like um, more recently, for the last few years, Uzbekistan started to invest more heavily in chess, and they saw they saw dividends from that. It was a very heavy competition. It was like, okay, who will win? Maybe U.S., maybe China, maybe India, maybe Uzbekistan. Not the last last time, um, and uh, and maybe some other country, right? All right, here we go. Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of the C Squared Podcast from a rooftop in Bucharest. We haven't done one of these live, over the board, online, offline. How would you want to call this podcast? Online, offline. Um, yeah, we haven't done a We've live done. one since... How long has it been? It's been a long time. Yeah. Because there was the candidates, and after that we didn't do any, Well, we didn't meet after the candidates until now. Perhaps March? Was that the last one we've done face-to-face? -face? March? What was in March? I'm trying to remember. I think it was the American Cup. We've done one during the American Cup. Oh, yeah, maybe during the American Cup. But even Cup. that might have been online. Yeah, I don't remember. Uh, American Cup. Yeah, it was, it was a bit of a blur because there was a whole candidate's preparation beforehand. So that took quite a lot of um, time. Yeah. And yeah, it's, it's been a while. Bucharest. We're in Bucharest. You just got here last night. It's extremely warm. It's about 90, 93 yesterday. I filmed the show opens in a full suit in 93 degrees weather. After five minutes, I was completely soaked. Yeah, um, it's pretty hot. Hopefully you guys will not see that, spot that on camera. But yeah, it's pretty painful. Anyway, we have a bunch of stuff happening in the chess world. A bunch of stuff has just happened in the past week as well since we last caught up. I believe the big news of the day was Jaspin versus Kramnik. We've discussed that. Yeah, I don't know, like what, has anything actually happened besides people talking? Nothing has no. actually happened, right? There, there have been no major events uh, or, or minor events even. Well, there, there has been the U.S. No, oh, the, the, the Karen's Cup. The Karen's Cup happened. Karen's Cup, okay. but that, also Uzbek Cup. Is that how it was called? But that was over when we filmed our last one. Was it? No, I that don't think finished, so. That was finished, wasn't I don't it? Think so. No, no, no. Just recently it finished. Eriga Isi won. By no, 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 no. So the Uz, Uz Cup, the Uz Chess Cup or whatever it's called, was won by Yakubov, uh, Norbeck Yakubov. Okay, I'm confusing the The Stepan Avagyan, Avagyan Memorial was won by... Um, Eriga Isi. By Arjun, yeah. Like very... Convincing. Very cleanly, yeah. Yeah. So he won, and then the and the Uzbek tournament was like tied between two Noterbeks. Like last year, they had like the same same thing, yeah, where they both played some open event. I forget which one, and they and they tied for first, and and Yakubov won, and no, um, Abdul Star got second. Yeah. And it was the same thing here. Yeah. Anyway, very convincing uh, victory in that one by Erigaisi. You uh, um, picked him as the top contender coming from India right now. You are getting the laurels because he's number four in the world, but it always changes. Yeah, I mean, they're all very strong. So it's not, um, yeah, it's hard. They're, they're all very strong. That's kind of what we could have expected as well, right? They're, they're all super strong. I think this is a point of discussion in the last week. Uh, the fact that he's made it all the way to the top 10, top five, right? In open tournaments for the most part. Um, and people were wondering why is he not getting invitations i think he's just about to be receiving quite a lot of invitations first of all he did play the grand gesture the first rabbit as a wild card yeah. he's not a full-time participant but still as a wild card he received an invitation there i think we're going to see much more of eric i in close events yeah, for sure. But also, I, I don't really think that he doesn't get invitations. I mean, the tournament in Armenia was an invitational, mm -hmm. closed round robin. Okay, it wasn't like 2750 average, but it was still like 2670, 2680 average. Uh, he played another closed tournament. Like, I was looking at his tournaments this year, which qualified for the Grand Fide Circuit, and half of them were uh, 
closed invitationals. Yes. And half were open events. So, the, the reason why he didn't get invited, for example, to the Grand Chess Tour, which is what people are mostly talking about on Norway Chess, is because his rating at the start of the year, when, or, yeah, at the start of the year when the invitations were being handed out, was lower than Prognanta, was lower than Noterbeck, Abdusitaro, uh, and was lower than Gukesh. That, that's it. That's the only reason. It's not like some some big thing. Now that he's 27 to 70, uh, all the invitations going forward, he will be one of the main guys to get them. I mean, the organizers only really go by average rating uh, of the tournament. They're just looking for the highest average rating. It changed a little bit. It used to be that way in the Grand Chess Tour. Now I think there is a fair play uh, criteria as well. I don't know what that means. <laughs> Well, you don't see some names in, in the GCT anymore that might have made it in previous years based on rating. But yeah, there is a fair play measure as well. Um, I, I still have no idea what that means. I don't know what you're talking about. Well, for example, there's been players in the past that have been invited because they had a rating, but they shouldn't have been invited. And for that reason, the organizers have changed the criteria of picking up players. Like, for example, if somebody's not that they're just okay. sitting on the radio. Okay, sure. Even if they're sitting for a little bit. Or if somebody just comes in and makes nine draws in like 20 minutes or like an hour. Okay. That's a fair play measure. Okay. Um, so I uh, think yeah. they're trying to adjust. Yeah, inactivity, of course, is, is a bit of an issue. Actually, I, recently there was some, some sort of talk with like players and with FIDE. Uh, and the basis of the talk was the FIDE circuit, what can be improved. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the one of the main questions was, are ELO ratings uh, accurate, and what to do about inactivity, which is, which is definitely a question. It's not like a it's not a player's fault if they're not like let's say they're retired, but they still do keep their. I mean, Gary is twenty eight twelve. He's still twenty eight twelve. Yeah. He might at some point be number one in the world, but of course, if he ever played again in classical chess, he's not going to keep his twenty eight twelve. Uh, but it's not his fault he retired and he just keeps the, his rating, right? So, um, yeah, inactivity will will, uh, will lead to some sort of, yeah, you could say inaccurate ratings. I mean, also not playing fighting chess. That falls into the okay, fair play. That, that's right the here. organizer's um, discretion. Correct. That's what I'm saying. Previously, you could have called it completely objective. Um, the setting in which the players were picked. Right now, there's a bit of subjectivity to it, which is, I think, a good thing. Sure. Yeah. Well, I, I th like I, I thought the people who were saying Arjun doesn't get invitations was just I, I didn't really understand the argument. I mean, he obviously gets invitations, and he'll get more in the future, and he deserves them. But like, the, it's not like some conspiracy against, <laughs> against him. It's just because his rating at the time of invitations was a bit lower. Now it's super high. But he got the invitations based on what his rating was, which is like he got invitations to those 2700 average rating tournaments. But now that his rating is 2750 plus, he'll get invitations to the 2750 plus yep. tournaments. And that's just how. Um, yeah, that's, that's what you'd expect, right? Yeah. So. But yeah, he's doing really well. He's also one of the. Like, his two main favorites for the FIDE circuit, I'd say at this point. It's Arjun, it's Noterbeck. Probably Noterbeck is a slight favorite. Just based on, he's had like the higher top performances, I think. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, but the the FIDE circuit is there are going, to, there should be some changes. There might be some changes there next might year. Be some changes, but there okay. there should be some changes because I think the the way that they calculate averages needs to be improved a bit. Like we've already mentioned, calculating top ten, top eight average for an open tournament doesn't lead to. Um, something which is indicative of the strength of the tournament or the like who you're playing. What I suggested to them was maybe take the average rating of your opponent and then calculate the FIDE circuit points based off who you play. So if you play 2500, 2500 average and you get first place then you get let's say 15 points but if you play 2600 average and you get first place and maybe you get 18 points. Mm -hmm. Something along those lines. Which is maybe also not a perfect idea but um, yeah that, that was one of the discussion topics. Was there any consensus? Yeah, there was consensus on a few things. I think one was that the Norway chess, a tournament like that, should probably be counted. Uh, and 
I think the other consensus was that I think also like Noderbeck raised the point that uh, having to play two open tournaments is is maybe not necessary. Like why why do you have to play two open tournaments? Because the the system, at least in the chess world now, is that open tournaments don't really offer much financial incentive. Some offers a little bit, but not really. Um, one of the ideas suggested by someone was that I think it was an arbiter who suggested it. Basically, it was to follow I think golf system, where uh, let's say you play ten tournaments. Um, but to counteract the fact that playing a, a huge amount will give you better odds, um, if you play over a certain amount, then the previous result will get replaced by a later result. Mm -hmm. So let's say if the maximum is 12 events, then if you play a 13th event, then you risk that your, uh, let's say, good result mm -hmm. at the start mm -hmm. of the year would be replaced by whatever happens in the 13th event. But then I, I think I suggested that this would be maybe unfair because then a player might have to decide like let's say I won Vikings A playing, basically. yeah like yeah. I won Vikings A in the start of the year so I got I don't know, 20 points whatever um, and now I get invited to a tournament which offers me good conditions at the end of the year and now I have to decide should I risk the FIDE circuit points or should I just sacrifice the money can you just say before you start the tournament I'm not going to count this as my points well th then that would just like to have the choice I can count it, or I can not count it. I think it would be overly complicated because then PDA would have like a bunch of people just sending yeah. in requests, and yeah. then they would have to do all this extra work. Yeah, and then people would also say this is not fair. It's not a perfect system. So sure. yeah, I, I, I thought okay, it's an idea, but I, I think the the system, the economic system in chess, doesn't really like a lot of chess players. Uh, they do struggle to make a living, mm -hmm. and they do most of by playing tournaments, and then you. And someone would have to like give them a choice between making money or maybe qualifying for candidates. It's a, it's not really a fair choice to give someone who who uh, shouldn't have to sacrifice money, right? Yeah. Today the opening ceremony of the Super Bet starts. Tomorrow uh, the games begin. It's a fun event actually. Again, um, much more eclectic. Let's say mix of players this year than the previous years. Almost like a change of generations which finally impacts the Grand Chess Tour as well. Um, you have Nodirbek who is, I'm talking about full-time tour players, I'm talking about Pragnananda, Gukesh. Gukesh, and there's another one, very young. Nodirbek, Prag, Gukesh, very young. I mean Ali Reza. Ali Reza, of course. Okay. 21, yes. I mean, Ali Reza, but Ali Reza has yeah, been around. Like, I, I've it's played so him strange, for so many right? years now that I don't know. <laughs> he's one of the young guys, but he's already played two candidates. And the first time I played him, not online but over the board, was 2020 by Kenze. Yeah, it's crazy. crazy. He's, he's been around for and so that, long. And that's over four years ago, so that's, that's already quite a I mean, four years is a significant amount of time in chess to have been playing at the top level. And then he was, he was a kid, right? So he still is. He's 21. Well, young, yeah. young adult. Yeah, yeah. He's, uh, he's sort of established, but he's also... Like, you can definitely imagine that, let's say he, like, like way he, he doesn't make huge progress in the next few years, but then still, like, at the age of 25, he still has a very good so chance to, let's say, one day become world champion. Because, like, way everyone thought, okay, he's, uh, he hasn't made progress, and then he becomes top 10, and now he looks like a, a very good candidate to, you know, be a top player for many years. Um, so yeah, we shouldn't underestimate how many years ahead a lot of these guys have. Yeah. Like, yeah, of course, the, the guys that are like Gukesh and Prague and so on, but 18, also 18 the guys who are a little bit, bit older, yeah, yeah like, uh, like Ali Reza. Um, actually, Arjun is 20, so he's a bit older than... Arjun Trump. is a bit on the older side. I think he just turned 20, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. Older than the Prague and Gukesh and so on. Yeah, yeah, still. Um, and Ar Arjun is not full-time participant in, in the GST. But yeah, it's this four versus, let's say, the more established Nepo, Yu, Wesley, Anish, yeah. Wesley, MVL. Yeah, um, so it, it's going to be a very, very interesting clash, let's say, of generations. And we haven't seen that in the GCT, definitely 
a welcome uh, switch. Looking forward to it. Um, it's not like, I don't know, is it a clash of generations? I was just I, thinking, I would say so. It's not like we're not so far apart. You, you guys are old. Yeah, but. Uh, but I mean, not when, really. I, when, I, <laughs> when I first got into like top, I don't know, 10 or so, the, the like previous generation, uh, like say the, the old guys were like Vichy, Kramnik, Topalov, Gelfand, Morozevich, Ivanchuk, um, Kamsky. It was these these guys, the, the guys who were the best players in the world in the '90s, and a few of them who were world champion. But they were already in their late late thirties, I guess, mm-hmm. early forties. Um, but I do feel like chess is getting younger in general. The trend, yeah, is, that's true, is is younger because like the the player at that time who was like at his very peak was Levon, mm-hmm. like. Uh, he was probably number two in the world, but very close to number one, 28-something, 28, 20, 28, 30. And he was in his early 30s. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So that was considered a very much a peak age. And now the peak has maybe gone down a little bit, or at least it's considered to be. Uh, I'm not sure if there's an objective peak, but let's say the public perception is more like the peak is players in their mid to early 20s. <laughs> it's funny, though. Well, I, I don't <laughs> want to be wrong about this, but... Um, during Poland, Magnus, I think, was the GST in Poland. Magnus was the oldest player. Yeah, but that's a tournament specific thing. Also, was Vichy not playing? No. Poland? No. No. I think Magnus he didn't mention, and it shocked me when he did. But during one of the interviews, I think the first one, he said that he's the oldest participant. It could be. Which was absolutely insane thinking about So I'm wondering, is Jan older than Magnus? I would assume that he's a bit older. Because Magnus was born in December. November. And close to December. November, oh, yeah, right. yeah. Like more or less of, November. Of November. And Jan probably. I, I, I really don't know people's birthdays. I think Jan is like a few months older than, than Magnus. And Jan wasn't playing pole. No. no. No, no, no. Anyway, very exciting uh, tournament. What else has happened in the chess world? Um, by the way, how do you generally approach this, this type of tournaments? Do you have the previous season, let's say, in mind? You're defending champion. Are you thinking about that at all, or it's just a new season? Completely new yeah, season? yeah, it's totally new. Last year is, is a long time ago. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I won this tournament last year, but of course. That doesn't mean that you're a favorite to win this year, right? It's, uh, it's, it's a new year. Uh, some of the players are the same. So who's the same? Jan, Anish, Wesley, Maxime all played last year. Noderbeck didn't, Bukesh didn't, Not Proud you guys did. Yeah. Uh, and Ali Reza did. Ali Reza did. So, so most of the players are actually the same from last year, if you think about it. It's three yes. new players. It's seven of the same. Uh, and and Dayak was there last year, so it's seven of the same players. Um, and the players that they replaced were... Ricci was one of them. Ricci was yeah, a full court right, was, is now replaced. Duda. Duda as well. Duda played in Poland. Was he a full-time participant? Duda played here. Last. The the thing is, he didn't finish because he got Ill. sick and he got ill in the Singfield Cup, mm. um, which was unfortunate. But yeah, I, I, that he was playing the full time. He just it was just bad luck that that he couldn't play the last one fully. So and there was one other player who I can't remember. Who. Yeah. Oh, ding, ding. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, but. But it's so, it was such a strange season, right? Because Ding basically quit midway through. Not midway. He, okay, he, he played the World Championship match. He became World Champion. He came straight he here. In Romania. He, uh, and that was it, right? And then he, he stopped playing the rest of the year. This was his last tournament last year. Yeah, yeah. Crazy. And he didn't play anything. Uh, like, absolutely nothing. I mean, he, he played like two online games, and then he was... And he's that, supposed to be a wild card. Yeah, he's going to play single Cup, but I think he's actually coming back, like, to activity. So, he already played Black and Zay, he played Norway, he played, like... He played Bisenhaus, um, played Grenke, so he's one of the more active players this year. He's he's going to play the World Championship. He'll play Saint Field Cup, we assume. Uh, but he's not playing this one. So yeah, yeah, those are the players. Anyway, very fun event ahead of us. What else has happened actually? Since we were talking about Ali Reza, and we always keep forgetting about again how young. He is, uh, but how well established he is at the same time. Um, we got a lot of shit in the last video for 
our conversation about Ali Reza and Hikaru. And I think we probably should address that. I don't know if we should, but we should probably address that. Um, basically, people were just saying that we were defending Hikaru and um, taking his side, bashing Ali Reza. It couldn't be, I would say, further from the truth. We've been pretty unbiased in general. Uh, regarding Ali Reza, we many, many times and many videos we've had plenty of good things to say about him. Um, he's an amazing player, so I don't think we've taken in that regard Hikaru's side. Um, and regarding Hikaru, it's just, again, we, we started this podcast not to be the TMZ of, of the chess world necessarily, right? Like, we could go insult by insult and analyze absolutely everything that was said, but we never took that route. It, it would be the easy route to take to get engagement and whatnot, um, but that wasn't our intention from the beginning. I don't know. That's at least how I saw it. And I wasn't giving, like, I wasn't trying to make the case that Hikaru was blame free or anything of that nature or, or that it was Ali Reza's fault. I was just saying that this is an explanation of why Hikaru might have acted in the way he acted. Not to excuse his behavior, of course, his behavior was, you know, some people didn't like it. I personally think a little bit of trash talk in competitive sports. Well, it wasn't trash talk. Thing. Okay, so it wasn't, I wouldn't call it trash talk. I think there's a difference. Trash talk is is something for the public. It's, a, it's playing up to the public. Like it's, sure. It's, uh, I mean, you see the, the boxers or the MMA fighters, right? They they say some, some bullshit before the match. Most of it is probably yes, um, manufactured to create some extra hype. There's definitely that's different. Okay, this, this was this was a uh, yeah. Hikaru said some things in the heat of the moment. Um, I think this is the difference between the internet and the real world. It's like on the internet, of course, people want to talk about something; they get a bit bored, and uh, and so they latch onto it. Uh, yeah, of course, he said some regrettable things, probably things that he regretted. And they didn't reflect well, uh, but in the real world, nobody actually cares. I mean, you see like so many interactions that are like that, or worse, and then they just like like people say some some stuff in the heat of the moment um, to each other in, in real life, and then you know they apologize. It's forgotten about. It's uh, like how many times you see this at uh, after people have had a few drinks or they get a bit competitive. Uh, Oh, behind the scenes, this happens all the time. No, but not even behind the scenes. Like just in real, normal life. Like, right. You you go go to a bar. I'm sure you're going to witness uh, a million interactions like that. You know. But People... we've seen that in competitive, like sure, us sure. playing, let's say, Buckhouse or us playing Blitz Chess after tournaments. There has been this type sure. of yeah. trashing. So this is like competitors, normal right? life. People have interactions like this. Sometimes it's it's not very um, cordial. Yes. And okay, but it's not something very newsworthy. I mean, like, what are we going to talk about? You know? That's that's the thing. You can go insult by insult. You can analyze absolutely everything. You can say that him bringing Ali Reza's family into question was obviously not the right thing. Then going for the chess bras, obviously not the right thing. Um, but again, we weren't analyzing insult by insult, you know. Uh, and we've <laughs> also how many like how many times have we been at something or at least I and then some like fight. <laughs> Not a fight, but like some small fight breaks out, people threaten each other a little bit, then uh, someone gets in the middle, mediates, it cools down, uh, you know, next day they, they apologize. I mean, I remember right? when Jobava, basically, Jobava Anish... Well, this was at a press conference, conference and it didn't even, like, people Jobava didn't care. basically saying people, that he's gonna... People didn't really up. care uh, back then too much. It's like, yeah, they... they, they um, this is like the 2014, I would say, Tashkent Grand Prix event. Yeah. I wasn't I wasn't at that press conference, but it was a press conference after they drew a game. Yeah. So you think after a draw, uh, nobody cares, right? But the entire argument was based on that they evaluated a position differently. Correct. And and I've had even this. Cause I I don't really get like too heated with these things, but I've I've had this with another player where we're working together, and then we evaluate a position differently, and I suggest that what he's saying is complete bullshit. But maybe I don't put it in the nicest way. And then this player thinks that I'm disrespecting his his chess ability. Uh huh. Um, 
which I, I'm not trying to, just I'm saying, okay, like, you're completely wrong. And then, and then he gets incredibly angry at me. And then, like, ha an hour later, cools down and we're like, okay, it's fine, whatever, and, you know, no hard feelings. And, and this is what happened during the press conference. Uh, they, they, they had a disagreement over the valuation of a chess position. Seems kind of um, like you shouldn't get into a fight over this, but yeah, it happens. And and the only difference is that the internet reaction back then was a bit more. I mean, we're less we were less online. Mm -hmm. it, like mm -hmm. We saw things mm -hmm. through through YouTube, uh, and it happened like a week after the fact, or a month after the fact, or whatever. And nobody cares too much. And now it's um, yeah, there, there's like this. It has to be captured in the moment, yeah. sort of news yeah. cycle, and uh, chess is not immune to that, but I don't know why it would be. I mean, every, everything is sort of uh, going in that direction. So yeah, the internet got got heated over this. They, everyone has their opinion. They're, they're entitled to their opinion, but that's, that's about it. Absolutely. And, you know, that kind of is in the past right now. Hikaru apologized for what he said directly to Ali Reza, so, you know, but all in all, I think in general, this type of, let's say, clashes, uh, animosity in the chess world, in competitive sports, they're going to happen naturally. Um, just because you haven't seen it, let's say, in chess, doesn't mean it doesn't happen. You see it in other sports, that's how you promote let's say, fights, for example, that's how you promote Wait, what fights. Was this? What happened between um, McGregor and, and Habib? When, okay, plenty of I examples. Mean, they, they, yeah. Like, one of them went to jail, no? Yes, McGregor like, this went is, to jail. Yeah, yeah, this is what, you know, <laughs> this is what constitutes uh, an actual fight in another sport. Correct. And in chess, it's like two, two guys on the internet, uh, uh, they're not even yelling at each other. No. And then one of them isn't even engaging, right? Right. And uh, and then this happens for like an hour, and, and people get worked up over it. <laughs> okay, that's good. Okay, in UFC, it, it uh, people go to jail, and uh, which I'm not saying is better, but uh, it's it's just funny the different degrees that we consider to be to be uh, dramatic. And we kind of see this shift in chess. Chess is changing in that we see the emergence of this one v one matches. You've seen the uh, you know uh, Hans versus. Very Vidit, good, that very just good uh, transition there. Yes, thank you, thank you. Uh, Hans versus Vidit, let's talk about that. We were discussing before it, but we didn't really look at it deeply. I thought Vidit is going to win. I don't know what you thought, but... Uh, I thought it was close. Hans, yeah. Hans got it. Yeah, Hans won. Uh, I thought it would be close, because it's Blitz, and they're... I mean, Vidit's good at Blitz, but Hans is also pretty good at Blitz. He's good. He's a good Blitz player, and... I don't know. In classical, it would also be close, but in blitz, like, there's no way that it wouldn't be a close one. Uh, even if like one or the other wins, it was probably going to. And it was quite a close margin, right? It yeah. was in the last segment that Hans won. Before that, I think that it had like a one point lead, and then in the last segment, Hans took over and uh, and won the match. Which was like, how many blitz games was it? It was it was over the course of a few hours. It was a one day. So event. three sections. First. 4 plus 2, second 3 plus 2, and the last one 2 plus 2. And I I hope I'm not wrong in this regard, but basically you were counting the sections, not the overall points. Like if you win two oh. sections, you win the match. Okay, that actually seems silly to me, like that uh, part of it. Because, uh, okay, that, that's how they do it in tennis. Yes, where you have sets. sets, basically. But, but I don't know, in, in chess I don't know if it makes sense to do that. But okay, that's a system that... Hans I've won heard the before. first one, um, we did one, and done Hans 3 plus 2, and 2 plus 2 was all Hans. Because also in tennis, all the sets are identical in terms of the regulations, like how, how many points win a game. But if you're doing different time controls, then it's almost like playing a different type of game, slightly. So, I don't know. I, I would still count it point by point, but okay, that's their system. Yeah, I think either way, Hans won. Like mm -hmm. if you count mm -hmm. by points or by sets, Correct. that's what you want to call it. Yeah. So yeah, he won, and it was, um, it was a thirty twenty match. Thirty k to the winner, twenty k to the loser. Big prize one. Yeah, it's a for one day of chess. It's um, it's about as good as you get. Like normally, top events, you can expect to get maybe an average of, if you're like a getting fifty percent in Grand Chess Tour, 
maybe you get 30, 40 K. Yeah. Uh, and that's over like 12 days of work. So to get 20, 30 over one day of work is of course much better. Uh, I mean, if you, if you could do this every day, then you would get <laughs> filthy rich very quickly. So that, that's a good, that's a good payday. And, um, and Han said that he's playing like another match against Anish. I don't know the details, but yeah. What do you think about this 1v1 matches? Do you want to see more of them? If they do a better job with them, promoting yeah, them, right? Yes. Like you couldn't even watch this match. I, it was during nighttime for me, so I didn't watch. I couldn't watch it. It was like five in the morning, four in the morning. I'm not gonna stay up all night to watch some good match. At the same time, if you think about it, that's because you are European fan. Sure, but okay, they cut out the entire European market, and they started at like eight p.m. Uh, Eastern. Uh, Eastern time. Yeah. So they're cutting out a large part of the. North American market too. Like, yes, I guess some people will, will watch at 8 p.m., but they also have to advertise it. They weren't doing that. Uh, and was it? It was on the weekend or on the weekday? I believe it was during the weekend. I want to say it was Saturday. Yeah. Okay. The North American market can watch this, but a lot of people aren't going to want to watch chess until midnight. I mean, it's not really peak hours for for watching. So. Yeah, if you're if you're Western time, I guess it's a bit better. If you're in California, then yeah, you start five p.m. This is usually the time main events for this. You know, I'm always making the comparison with UFC, but that that's basically when the main events are. Sure, they still have to advertise it better. Like nobody knew it was way going on. better. Holy smokes! The only way you could actually find out it was going on was through Twitter hots and just basically. Yeah. yeah, but even Ch like Chess Base India was they hosted on their YouTube. They weren't like doing promotional work advertising. Yeah, and okay, Chesapeake India has a huge channel, so they have uh, like a million subscribers, maybe maybe a million and a half. I don't know exactly, but they have a big YouTube. But they're capturing only one, mainly one market. Uh, they're completely cutting off a major chess market. They're not advertising. The website uh, was not, and I think it was also six a.m. in India or something like that. Yeah, I guess four a.m., six a.m. People could watch, uh, wake up and watch. Uh, but yeah, it, it wasn't. They didn't do it right, especially, no. especially when you have some pretty prominent like football guys there. Yeah. Um, like Kyler Murray uh -huh. was there, right? Yeah. Um, who was who was like the main organizer from the? From the I don't know if American football too well. Yeah, me neither. <laughs> um, okay, I'm gonna find this. It was the Browns. Running back? Wait, let's see. So we're talking about the universal chest tour. Chest tour. Chest tour. I don't even know if you made a good point in one of our discussions. If you don't get it right the first time, yeah, that's you invest so much money, you don't get the second chance. Um, so it's okay. The money comes from these guys who can definitely raise a lot of money. Like these these NFL guys, mm -hmm. they can raise a lot of money easily, or even they can put up their own money. It probably doesn't really put a dent. Amari Cooper, Amari Cooper, yeah. And but then they're not going to want to put the effort in if they don't see significant hype or numbers, because it's a lot of effort. It's like I was talking to Maurice, and who was um, organizing Millionaire Chess, and it's like not just the money, but the amount of work that you put into an event like Millionaire Chess, and then if you don't see like a really significant result from it, why would you want to put in all that effort? So you you do want to get it right the first time. Uh, I think like, and by the way, to be honest, in comparison, Millionaire Chess was very well organized. Very well organized, yeah. they they receive, they, they had quite decent part, participation, strong players, Hikaru, yourself, Wesley, Wesley uh, Ray, Ray won once. A lot of very strong players. Wesley won once. They actually, did it right. Icar won once. They, they actually did it right. In, yeah, yeah. In but, my opinion. But okay, these tournaments don't necessarily make money. That's the other issue. Millionaire Chess, you have They put a million dollars into the prize fund. Uh, that was like 50k first, but then they have the category prizes we talked about and so on and so forth. Actually, you know, I saw Levy talk mentioned that we talked about category prizes and he sort of agreed. And. Um, that the category prizes don't make sense in American Opens. 
and some people will disagree, right? Mm -hmm, but, mm -hmm. Of but course. I, I sort of, yeah. I, I don't see why we have these these huge category prizes, but it's not it's not really um, uh, an issue. I'm, it's not a hill I'm really to die on. I don't care that much. <laughs> but um, yeah, these these tournaments they very often lose money, especially if you're going the broadcast route. Like, let's say the World Open or something, they don't have expenses. Right? I mean, they, they don't do any broadcasts. No. There's no broadcasts. They don't even supply boards or clocks or anything. Uh, they rent out a ballroom, I guess, and that's the extent of their... They don't give hotel rooms. They don't give conditions. But the thing about renting the ballrooms, generally the hotel gives you uh, a deal on that. Like, basically, they sometimes even give it to you for free, as long as you accommodate, let's say, 200 rooms in their yeah, hotel. You probably do more than that. Yeah. Like, World Open, yeah. Maybe you're, you're giving the hotel significant business. And the ballroom usually comes for free. Sure. So, so they are just supplying the prize fund, and then a lot of that prize fund is is guaranteed from, from the um, entries, entry fees. Yeah. And very often, if they don't get sufficient entry fees, then only like a portion of it is guaranteed, like forty percent, right, guaranteed or so. So these these tournaments are money makers for the organizers. Now, that's the point. Like, would would they be able to host them if they didn't have these uh, big and big uh, category prizes? Which are paid for by charging people two hundred bucks, and will people pay two hundred bucks if they don't get a chance at, at you know maybe a five k first first prize for under sixteen hundred or, or whatever it is, which is a question as well. So anyway, again, not not an issue that I'm too invested in. Last uh, big topic of discussion that made waves this past week was uh, the topic of changing federations. Hans obviously said that chess players should not be allowed to change federations once they play one game for one federation. Um, I think that's silly. I mean, obviously, your case is was mentioned. I don't know why, because you were born in the U.S. You did play for I changed federations, yeah. Italy in um, 2005, then and, changed federations, and then in 2015, yeah. Yeah, so ten years with the time federation, but. From especially your perspective, you can make the case that you know you change federations because you move at a certain age from the U.S. to compete on a regular basis. There aren't as many tournaments in the U.S., and uh, you could say that this change actually helped your career and then ultimately helped the U.S. by having you as a top player. So you can make both both cases. Sure. Yeah. I look at to me, it's it's not really on the players. It's on the federations and the governing bodies if they want to change it so that players can't change federations that's something that can be argued I think that when someone let's say in this case Hans brings up a very specific group of players for me it really just falls flat because it doesn't seem like he's arguing that this is like a systematic issue but it just seems like he's arguing that this is negatively impacting him for whatever reason, which I also disagree with. And and then he's making a point for this. Because uh, Hans did play the world team, and his team members were like Onishuk, Lazaro Bruzon, um, and like, you get like the full team. He was, a, he was the he was the first board, Hans was the first board. Right? Uh, I, I actually don't think that there were like any American uh, born natural U.S. born players on the team, which he didn't really complain about then. Of course, if if it's not negatively impacting you, then why would you complain? Mm -hmm. But now he's not going to make the team, which is actually it's very close, I think, because it's between him and Ray. Yeah, and it's very very close. And then suddenly the the complaint comes. So um, again, I I don't have an issue with the like discussion as a whole, but. You could make it about like the whole chess world, and not just the the few players that that means that you're not playing on the team this year. Which again, it's not just. Uh, and also, Ray is is maybe going to play on the team uh, if he cards declines. Yeah. Which I, I don't know if he card will or not, but let's just uh, say that if he cards declines, then then Ray would be playing, and and Ray is. Uh, well, you can't make that argument. He's always played for the U.S. So as he card, so you can't make that argument, right? Uh, for me, for Wesley, for Lanier. I guess the, all, the other question is like, let's say if you come from a country which has some uh, like either serious economic problems or maybe problems related to war or some problems that that negatively impact you and you need you want or need to escape the country. 
uh, and this would be like okay, we can we can use this as an example for Russian players from the past two years. But also, let's say if you're if you're a Cuban player, you might have these um, these reason reasons to change federations as well, right? Then, is it fair to to force a player to stick with their federation, even though I think that's big. That that's this question, and uh, so either they stick with their federation or they don't have a federation. Is the other question, or they're they're not allowed to switch to the U.S. Like, um, I don't know for for Lenier's example, for example, he did take some sacrifices to switch. I mean, I, I know this because we were working together at the time, and he couldn't play. He couldn't play while he was switching. He, he couldn't travel. Uh, I mean, he wasn't allowed to travel while while he had his green. While he's applying for a green card, right? And so it's not like this was some sort of uh, decision which wasn't born out of perhaps necessity for him, right? It's, that, that's another question. Uh, and for a lot of players, like now, if we look at uh, the aftermath of of, um, of Russia and Ukraine, a lot of Russian players fled to other other federations. And is it fair to tell them that they can't do that? Mm -hmm. Or are we going to like go case by case, which you can also do, right? Say, well, yeah, it's okay for this reason, but not for this reason. Sure, I understand. Um, but yeah, most players will be trying to do the best for their career. That's exactly. Right. In, in, in the world of chess, we don't have as many resources, right? So there's always going to be a fight between the players, the organizers, the heads of federation, whatnot. And this gives the power to the players, all in all, right? The federations, look, you have to give the players the best. You made the point of Russia and Ukraine, obviously Lanier with uh, Cuba, but also we, we've seen recently the move of uh, Bishop to Spain, just because yeah, the Argentinian Bishop Federation from, from Argentina, was, yeah. yeah, they were just not right. treating Ituri him well. Zaga from Venezuela. Ituri Zaga, who plays for Spain as well. So you see yeah, a lot it, of movement. This is like countries with serious economic problems as well. Exactly. I mean, it, yeah. if you can't make money, or if, like in the case of Venezuela, your currency is completely devalued, then your career is done. Well, it, at least it's like, I mean, I, I wouldn't, definitely wouldn't blame the player. Now, if the if they put some rule, whatever their rule is, I, I don't know what it would be. But yeah, it's, uh, I don't really understand what the argument is. Is he saying it's wrong to change federations for everyone, or just in very specific cases? Or is he saying that FIDE should implement a change? Yeah, I get it. Maybe maybe that could be argued, but it would have to be something. I think that like why are we trying to hurt players who maybe are doing things that that they need? Um, I'm not even speaking from my case. I'm speaking more from cases of like like the Italian Federation was was a good experience for me. Yeah, you know, when I played for Italy, uh, I wasn't trying to escape something bad or anything. And uh, for me, it was also like U.S. Is, is quite quite a bit closer to home as well. Yeah, from a like personal, cultural point of view. Yeah. Uh, you were born here, you, you speak the language, you so, don't speak Italian that well. So maybe like the strongest argument would be made against me. Yeah. But if you're looking at it from a point of view of who is the, like the most American or whatever, then then yeah, maybe you could make it for other players. But yeah, no, I, I would, I definitely wouldn't blame um, blame players for their personal choices. And, and then you would have to apply it to everyone. It, it's not, I don't think it's honest from yeah. an intellectual point of view, just to say, just to say, yeah, you, these players are, are, are wrong, but then to ignore like all the players who who left. I mean, why do people go to Spain? It's like uh, it's a really nice country it's to live a nice in. Yeah. Sunny. <laughs> yeah, it's a nice country to live in. That's why they, they go to Spain. And how many chess players have lived in Spain? Top chess players throughout the like last uh, few decades is yeah, you can't can't count. And okay, Shiro. Uh, played for Spain. Um, a lot of like Russian players went to Spain as well. It's I think players will will be doing things which are good, good for them. their yeah, careers, which, yes. or or just good for their life. And yeah. So, and uh, is it fair to tell them you shouldn't do that? Now I don't know about other sports. That's the thing which I have no expertise on. So I, I don't know like how to compare it to Olympic sports or um, or other things. Now there's one argument which could be made is that like the country which is willing to dump a lot of money into chess. Will have an advantage because they can, you know, buy players. Like, let's say, which is a, a fair argument, but this also does encourage maybe some countries to invest more heavily in chess. Like, like um, more recently, 
for the last few years, Uzbekistan started to invest more heavily in chess, and they saw they saw dividends from that. So it does encourage some countries to invest more heavily, which is not a bad thing. Yeah. I think it would be bad if, like, let's say one country had all the money to invest, and then they just took all the players and there's no competition left. Mm -hmm. But we really don't see that. Like, there's a very heavy, if we're looking at the Olympic, Olympia, there's a very heavy competition. There's like, okay, who will win? Maybe US, maybe China, maybe India, maybe Uzbekistan, like last, last time. Um, and, uh, and maybe some other country, right? Uh, I don't know exactly which countries have, like, very realistic shots, but maybe Azerbaijan. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe Armenia, they did very well last year, about two years ago. Uh, maybe Hungary, who are, are quite strong now. So, yeah, it's it's a complicated subject. I, I I don't mind like the subject as a whole, but I think it's it makes sense to look at it from a neutral perspective, not like oh these players are taking taking my job, which is also not true at all. Uh, like that's the other thing. I've I've heard this before, but uh, if you have a lot of strong players in a country, it really doesn't detract from your career. Uh, if if you're a, a 2700 player and there's no other 2700 players, it's not like you're going to become super super rich in the country. Uh, if you're a 2800 player and you're and you're amongst like let's say six other 2800 players, like okay, six is excessive. But at some point, uh, if we go back to 2015, I think I was around 2800. Hikaru, Wesley, uh, and we're we're all playing for the same country, right? And I didn't feel like I was being negatively impacted by the fact that, yeah, I would have been like clear number one if they weren't there, but, but because they're there, I'm, I, I didn't feel like I was being negatively impacted, quite, quite the opposite. I felt like, like this is overall a beneficial thing just to have more players. Uh, and yeah, maybe it feels that way if, if you don't get a spot on the team. But on the other hand, if you increase your rating by 20 points, you get a spot on the team. And that, that should be your goal to, to, not try to get like the top in my country without other players, but to get like the top in the world, yeah, which includes everyone. Um, so yeah, I, I don't really see his argument as as like super valid the way that he presented it. I'm sure he's going to use that as motivation. You know, uh, you know, take that in a positive way. Work hard, cons, get your rating up, and you'll make it. Uh, but yes, tell us what you think. Interesting subject for sure. This one with the switch of federations. Tell us what you think in the comments. And uh, yeah, I guess we'll see you in the next one. Sure. Cheers.